And now, after hearing the three um, speaker from the Springboard Couplet category, I would like to draw your attention back to the next uh, category, it's the Junior Championship category, it's very impressive. So hopefully you enjoy the presentation. So the first speaker of the Junior category is from the public uh, high school in Cambodia, is from Brasisabad High School. Her name is so I'm um, Hola Soria, and she's going to present it on the topic of should we tax the rich more than the poor. And before that, we have um, she also uh, doing some short video clip to express about herself a little bit before she presentation. So hopefully you enjoy the video clip and also her presentation. Thank you. Championship. <laughs> บาดประชาชนสมัญเชิญไปกับชนเสียมฮอลลาโซยาดันมกปีวิชัยไลประสิทธิ์สวัสดิ์ได้กอดจับบานประเทศนบอร์ดระยะเปย์มนตร์ประ
earned his money to afford his life. So it is unfair for the rich people to actually pay higher tax than those who are poor. But in order to be fair, I believe that what we should do is that we should find a, more, a solution rather than saying rich people should pay higher tax than poor people. So what is the solution? One is that tax should be taken according to the salary that the individuals earn. If they earn a lot of money, then maybe we should take 10% of the money that they earned. And for the poor people, poor people are mostly farmers and labor workers. So that is the reason why they don't earn a lot of money. But instead of taking more tax or maybe taking the same rates of tax like the rich people, we should consider giving them education so that they can you know, become more proficiencies in the area that they're doing. For example, if they're working in agriculture, which means they're a farmer, then we should provide a, trained, a trainer or maybe um, educate them in order to make them more professionals in all, and, and so that they can make a more you know, products they can have more products. And another one is that I believe, thank you very much. No, no. Thank you, Soya, for your presentation. And now this is the time for questions. <laughs> yes, so this is the time for question and answering. บาสมาคอนทราร์ดจมพัวกัญญาเอ่อซอยาชื่อมันต่อเตนี้ซอมเอนเจอคณะกรรมการ <laughs> Do you think that young people who make a lot of money just because it's given to them from their parents should be taxed more? I believe mm, that would be unfair if they actually, you know, inherited a lot of money and then they should tax more because it's because of their parents' hard work. But instead of taxing them, maybe we should advise them to join volunteer work instead of taxing a lot of money and that they're going to, you know, maybe saying that the government is unfair or something, we should ask them or advise them to do volunteer work. And another one is that if the parents earn the money because, let's say, um, they open a factory or something like that, then we have to charge them according to the amount of carbon footprints they have to release in the air. So one, we can have better environment for everyone, and another one is that it's not unfair for him. And the third one is that it can raise up his reputation instead of saying that he depends his life on his parents inherited. And then he volunteered that says that it's because he wants to help people. Thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs> one more question. There, there is a large group of people that do believe rich people should pay less tax. Can you think of any good reasons why that might be true? Um, sorry, do you mean like the poor people, they should pay less tax? The poor people should pay more tax and the rich people should pay less tax. Oh, well, that is totally, um, totally opposite of, of what I've been thinking. But I believe that that is not a great idea to actually make those people pay more tax. Why? The poor people, they already poor. So how come they have the money to support the tax? And another reason is that poor people... Thank you so thank you much. Yes, for your presentation and challenging with the questions. Yeah. So to save your time, I would like to announce the next speaker. The second speaker from the junior category is going to be a man from the public skills again, Tisa Wat High School, and his name is Lee Hain. Ba so ma kon chan chi man to tiet ni ku da pai ka chon ba yeung ku Lee Hain dai kot ma pi vichia lai pra si sawat. Ba hai kot cha ban ma thien robot doi ye ka nya ban prap. Hai som cheung tu sna na vid ao dai ma chi ang pi khluen kwa ba so kon. Hello everybody, my name is Lee Hain. I'm 
name is Hong Hei, and I am a senior student at Sisi High School. Last, I am the finalist for the English Spring for the Springboard Captain English Championship. Ladies and gentlemen, the moment of nervousness has arrived. It's time for my final presentation, and I hope that all of you could enjoy it. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My topic for today is that are, are you meant to blame for global warming? Global warming has been raising an issue for the government today to tackle all these problems. And this, um, this crisis has been woven since history, especially in the 19th century, where we call it the industrialized revolutions. And from that time on, global warming has been woven. To see whether we are to blame or not for the global warming, we must first look at the root causes of the global warming. According to the scientists, they separated the root cause into two categories. The first category, we call them natural activities, while the second category, we name them human activities. So what does natural activities contribute to global warming? According to the NASA report, a stiff change in the solar output could affect our temperature. How? First, if just a slightest change in the solar radiation, especially in the circulation of the sunspot, could raise the temperature of the Earth, especially by, by one degree Celsius, which is a lot for the Earth. Furthermore, another contributor to, uh, of natural activities is the volcanic eruptions. Because when the mountain explodes, it produces gas and particles, and these gases and particles block the sun heat from entering, from entering the Earth's atmosphere. Therefore, it cools down the Earth's temperature. However, um, the, the particles, the gases, also produce carbon dioxide, which is a harmful gases to the environment of our Earth, and it also raises the temperature. So this concluded the, the, the category of natural activities. Now, let's move on to our human activities. How does we contribute to the global warming? According to the IPCC fourth assessment report, IPCC, which stands for Intergovernmental Panel of, Glo of Climate Change, illustrate that a burning of a fossil fuels could um, raise the temperature of the Earth very dramatically. So the burning of the fossil fuels, it produces greenhouse gases, which contain uh, carbon dioxide, uh, nitrogen oxide, and sulfur dioxide, plus methane gas. So how does these gases affect, uh, raise the temperature of the Earth. First, we have our ozone layer that's around in the atmosphere, and this ozone layer allows the sun to enter the Earth's atmosphere, but also reflect them back to the space. While greenhouse gases, they destroy the ozone layer, and they destroy the ozone layer, and moreover, they allow sun, uh, sun heat to enter the Earth's atmosphere, but they don't, allow them to, they don't allow them to reflect back to the space. Therefore, um, the heat would remain in, inside of Earth's atmosphere and then raising the temperature of the Earth from the core to the surface. In addition, um, in addition to the point of human activities, we also see um, the deforestation. We also consider them to be the root causes to global warming. So how does that, how does chopping a tree contribute to global warming? At first, we must look at the scientific process of a plant life. We call them photosynthesis. It's a process where a plant observes carbon dioxide and then produces oxygen. Well, and then we could deduce that if the amount of trees is decreasing, then the amount of carbon dioxide would have increased. And this carbon dioxide is the greenhouse gases, which I have stated earlier, that contribute to global warming. And another part is um, further, uh, another part to uh, human activities is the chemical waste that produces by industrial uh, manufacturing industries. Mostly ma manufacturing industries located near the oceans, and they produce chemical waste that contaminated the ocean, and they change the they and they they unbalance the ecosystem of Mother Nature, and by unbalancing something, it would rather cause consequences, and the consequences that follow is the global warming. So, in conclusion, even if the contributors to global warming is not solely human activities, and which, which included natural activities, however, natural activities is an evolution of the Earth. The Earth created them, and they balance them out, like the volcanic eruptions. They produce particles that cool down the Earth, but also gases that raise the temperature of the Earth. When they come together, they balance each other out. So, I can strongly state that 
um, human activities is the one to blame for the global warming. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lee here for your uh, wonderful presentations. And now, to make this program more excited, we would like to take the opportunity to our honorable guest, or maybe ambassador, would like to ask you some questions. So please. Okay, thank you very much indeed. That was really interesting. Thank you. Uh, my question, you've, you've concluded that humans are to blame for global warming. Uh, historically, most of the carbon emissions have been produced by developed countries. So my question is, is it fair to expect developing countries to reduce their emissions too? To answer that question, yes, developing countries does produce a lot of carbon, di carbon dioxide emissions. Um, uh, however, uh, those carbon dioxide uh, pr um, emissions produced from burning fossil fuels, while developing countries have not yet developed an industry that could burn a fossil fuel for electricity. Let's take Cambodia as an example. We still buy electricity from Thailand or from Vietnam. We, even though we are de in devel developing countries, we still cannot produce our own electricity. So if we are to blame, if, if uh, we are to blame for this global warming, we must first look at the developed country. We are they exploit the natural resources, which is unrenewable, and produce the electricity. And they did not sit and implicate about the consequences that follow. Therefore, I could strongly say that even if um, Developing country does require uh, electricity and produce some of the carbon dioxide emissions, but we still have to look at the developed country, which have been um, exploiting all the resources for a very long time. Yes, thank you. Any more question from our judges? Um, yes. If, if, if you were to answer, which one to, bl uh, to blame more, men or women? <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for your questions. If you look at the history of science, we have seen a lot of uh, scientists which is male and rarely female. And if you look at the one who produces electricity, um, Benjamin Franklin, he is the man, uh, the scientist of the United States. So I can strongly answer the questions that men are more to blame because, uh, <laughs> well, we see that men uh, evolve in science a lot and we have rarely seen human scienti uh, female scientists. So, yes, I think male are to blame for the most. Yes, thank you, Li Hei, for your presentations and challenging the questions. So, the last speakers of the Junior Championship category today is going to be also the youngest um, contestant of the Springboard Kaplan English Speaking Championship as well. So, please welcome <laughs> Som Solita, who represented ICS International School, and she's going to present on the topic of should city grow, be restricted, and control. And hopefully, before that, she, uh, she also have uh, some interesting video clip to show everyone. So hopefully, you enjoy her, uh, her video. Thank you. Hi, my name is Salida, and I am an eighth grader in ICS International School. And I'm also the representative of my school in this competition. Ladies and gentlemen, my time has come and I hope you enjoy my presentation. Give me all your support. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Wow, there's a lot of people here. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to go straight up to my topic. Um, the question is, should city growth be restricted and controlled? Well, technically, in my opinion, it is definitely, you know, it's, governments should take action to this. So, yes, um, technically, cities that have a high population should be controlled, but I'm going to get to that later. So, um, As the world is rapidly developing, you can see that globalization is probably gaining access to almost every country. Um, it is certain that the world population itself will grow. So I'm not sure if everybody noticed this, but um, in the last decade, there has been a population explosion where there was about 20 babies made in every minute. So you can see that there's, this is a very dramatically changed population, and it could definitely provide as a social change to, wor to the world. Um, there are two main reasons to why city become high populated. One of them is because that certain city is enriched of everything. 
And the second reason is because it um, has a very high birth rate. So the first reason, I would like to pick um, the Singapore as a, a, an example because as we know, Singapore is a very low birth rate country, but it is probably one of the most developed country in Asia. And the good, the good thing about that is that it has a very great education programs. I can see a lot of people migrating to Singapore to have better education. And um, there's, it's also a good place for tourism and also for new companies to, you know, um, to ma uh, make new inventions and where technologies um, develop dramatically. So, so it's a good place to land all your um, dreams there. But on the downside is because more companies are planning to work in Singapore and you know more people are migrating to Singapore, it's um, because of the fact that Singapore is an island, it is hard to have enough space for a big resilient community. So that, that is a problem, and in the future, you know, even if there is a low um, population in Singapore now, in the future you may never know, it could definitely change dramatically. Um, the second reason is that um, countries like India and China are known for their world population growth, and because um, in this case, I believe that controlling the growth of cities and areas are very essential. So in, in India, for an example, in Dubai, there is a very high birth rate. And the reason to that is because women or teenage girls are not taking up in birth control and contraception. So that means that um, they, don't, they don't have jobs, um, they get married earlier, and um, this really affects to the economy of the country, and it causes a very high birth rate, and that's the bad thing about it. But um, if the, I think if the government could you know, um, create new ways to lower the birth rate, um, the city could very much become developed in the future. Um, and also, it is very important for women to understand more about contraception and birth control and also for more educated people to, um, to be, um, more educated people are there um, to, you know, develop their nation. Um, yeah, so, um, as we can say, Singapore is a very good example for um, uh, a city growth that is very um, high, maybe in the future, but it definitely um, the government would do something to control that. And also, um, countries such as India and China have high population, both in the city and in the rural areas. So I hope there's many ways you know, people could come together, volunteer to um, teach the people about you know, education, the importance of the economy, economy, um, both socially, to make social changes to the world, and that will definitely contribute to um, a better future. Um, yes, yeah, so I'd like to conclude um, that um, the city growth should definitely be restricted if the population, you know, if the population is too high in the future. Um, governments, I hope they will try to make new laws and rules so that people could take up easily. Um, there wouldn't be any arguments or any, you know, um, uh, problems in certain countries because, you know, if you take up a new rule, it could cause many political problems, but um, I hope that doesn't happen. And technically, I think um, it's important that people should understand about the world and learn more about the city growth and learn how to, you know, prevent from any um, hard um, and also know that the city should, is a place for dreams to come true, for people to fulfill their jobs and their careers and everything. And you know, that's, yeah, that's pretty much all. <laughs> Thank you, Solidars, for your presentations. And now, this is the time for you to um, answer the question from our judges. So please, the judges, give some questions. <laughs> The ambassador would like to try or anyone? Okay, please. Yes. Thank you very much. I, I really enjoyed that. Okay. Um, question. If, um, if you, is there a danger that if you restrict the growth of cities, then people will start building more things in the countryside, therefore destroying more forests, harming more wildlife, and destroying the environment more generally? 
Yes, um, I believe that that does happen because, of course, naturally, if you if you tell people to move in other places because the city is too full, they will try to you know make more places. They will try to find spaces in a country, a certain country, such as Cambodia. Cambodia can really be a good example. If the city does get too populated in the future, they they would try to make more companies. Companies would take up lands in rural areas. But I think a better way to do that is. Really, they have to, you know, it has to be balanced. They have to understand the physical changes and the impacts that if you do, um, if you do cut down forests and cause, you know, global warming and deforestation, you should know the consequences to that. And you have to teach the people to understand, to make a very balanced, you know, um, way in order to have a, a good community. It, they have to understand what the consequences is. So. Yes, please. Yes, one. <coughs> one other point is: is not a, a city an image of a network of communities? People join together in cities because they want to be part of a new community, a new sort of community. And therefore, we shouldn't restrict cities. We should restrict the negative consequences of cities, pollution. But good cities are, are communities of civilized individuals, like Oslo. Okay, thank you. Um, well, it is, it is true that, yeah, you can't restrict, you know, the good cities that are trying to make you communities. Um, because they believe that the city is the best place to, um, you know, put down their career and, you know, uh, work on their jobs and careers and their future studies. Um, but at the same time, you know, if the city g does get chaotic, there has to be something that's been done to the city. And thank yeah. you, Solidus, yes, for your presentation. And also thank you to our honorable judges for giving a wonderful questions. Yes, so I would like to continue the programs. And now we are coming to the third category, is an open championship category. And to start the time again, so I would like to welcome to Mr. Sun Sotvisas. And he, in the open category, he's going to present on the topic of should the football be paid more than the farmers? And it's also an interesting topic for the entertainment. Hopefully, you enjoy his uh, video clip and also his presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. This is Vista from QC, and I am registered in this contest in the public area. Thank you. Last morning, my friends, I need you. You are my power. Cheerio. Respectful guests, our honors, Excellency Ambassador Magudi, Excellency Kyokwanyirat, Minister of Information, Honorable Judges, Excellency Ladies and Gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you for being with me here today to witness myself in this kind of competition when there's a lot of challenges as well and we need to elaborate. And one of the very interesting issues we shall go for today is should a footballer be paid more than a farmer. Fresh. So, Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that if you were asked that kind of question, you would probably be in dilemma in my case right now. So, before things kick off, why don't we just divide the two characteristic of the two aspects and then go for it, main and central characteristic as and then we can come up with a final decision letters. And the main reason is that the two characteristics cover the GDP share to the country. And then I would probably come up with the first one 
And so, Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to start first with the agricultural perspective. So, agricultural section is very important to one country, especially if it is in the case of a developing one. And in the case of Cambodia, it is a very important issue when it share a large percentage of GDP to uh, many thousands and millions of people in Cambodia through the tens of thousands tons of rice produced in the agricultural sectors. And essentially, ladies and gentlemen, totally there are approximately around 30% to 80% of farmers contributed in the farming areas which share to the gross domestic product. And gross GDP, which is the sum of all goods and services produced in the economy, is really important to people's standard of living. So, Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, it's quite simply that if the GDP is up on the previous three months, it means that the economy is growing. But if it is negative, it is contracting. And the two consecutive, two consecutive Three month period of contraction mean your economy is in recessions. Because the economy was calculated by the GDP four times a year, it means it has to be calculated each three months. And the two consecutive three months mean that the six months and then if your GDP is going to be decreased and decreased and then your uh, state economy is going to be die down. So now it's the case of the agricultural in these sections. So now let's go together for another one when we refer to the sports section. That's also one other very important factor to contribute to the state economy. And because many countries in the world would like to take place as a house country in some kind of a competition, like for example for the World Cup challenges, as it would attract many tourists and it would introduce the country into the world. And some of the footballer, famous footballer in the world, like for example David Beckham, which is serving his service in the Manchester United, earned a lot of million US dollars just only for the seasons. And as quoted on the Office of National Statistics of the UK has mentioned that the boost of the economy of the UK has been risen from 0.1% uh, in the three quarters of the years. And it is will share a very big percentage from the ticket selling of Olympic in 2012 and Paralympic of 2017. So, and the Prime Minister of the UK has mentioned that um, the economy was on the right track. So, in conclusion, I believe that it depends on the circumstances of the status of each individual who was born in such a kind of very hard status. Like for example, if I would be born in such a kind of very developed world like the UK, I would stand on the side to be supporters of uh, the footballer. But in my real situation, right now as one of the citizens in my beloved poor countries, I would suggest that the motion should be revised. As Kenny used to be at once said that, a man without food can hardly survive. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Visa, for the presentation. And now I would like to pass the floor for our judges to give some questions. Thank you. Visa, thank you very much for your speech. Um, I work for the BBC. We make television programs. We make one program here called Life Up for BBC. <laughs> It's a way to make things entertaining so people enjoy them. Now, footballers are paid a lot of money if they're very, very, very good. Because we think it's entertaining to watch very, very, very good footballers. Can you think of a way that I could make a TV show about very, very, very good farmers? <laughs> All right. Uh, so I have mentioned uh, that it is hard to get one side which you refer to. 
just only the case of each individual who have experienced the different unique characteristics of each and it depends on the circumstance of the one who were born in such a kind of the status. If you were born in such a kind of a poor country, you would probably support the agricultural sectors because people would not have any more feeling to enjoy themselves if they find a hard time to find something to eat and to feed their stomach and their children. So in case like that, if I would, I would probably believe that you're from uh, some kind of developed world, so you are already enjoy with your life, so people can gather around to enjoy more sweet time with your family while watching the television according to the uh, very nice show regarding to the football. But for farmers, it's very hard. And then if one day they can improve their GDP and their standard of living is going to be increasing and then they will probably also support uh, the farmers, uh, the food allows. As also mentioned in the physical education division that uh, sport is the best approach to uh, is the best for, for students to work hard and for the country to strengthen the relationship. And so it is quite well if your economy is already up, you can promote the footballer. Thank you. Thank you, Vital and all the judges. And after hearing the first speaker of the open category, we are now sure he is the next speaker is going to be Ong Ti Ketsha, and he is going to present on the topic of is vocational education work related to education more important to your country development than in academic education? Yes, so please. Hello everybody, my name is Ketsia. I'm from Institute of Foreign Languages and I'm 22 years old and I'm one of the contestants who are competing in the final round of Springboard Copland English Speaking Championship. My speech will begin in any minute now. I hope you all enjoy it. I will try my best. Well, good afternoon, His Excellency, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. Today is a great day, isn't it? <laughs> well, today I have one story to tell you all. It's simply, I'll be talking about education. So, education, we are talking here, is about the center of human growth and development. So, in particular, I'll be comparing the significant difference between two types of education. First, vocational education. Second, academic education. So before getting to arguments, I will explain the key terms of these two uh, educations. First, vocational education. It refers to a training of a particular field or train to be an uh, uh, skillful occupation in, in particular field. For example, uh, agriculture, industry, economics. So these education train to become skilled labor. Second, academic education. It refers to education we all acquire through universities, schools. It's about theories, concepts. So it's a foundation of knowledge so the difference between the two here is vocational education is more practical and academic education is more theoretical or conceptual. So which one is the most important for country development, whether it's vocational education or academic education? In this matter, I personally believe that both types of education plays an equal significant role for country development. I want to raise one case study, simply our country, Cambodia. As you already know that Cambodia development heavily depends on agriculture. We have 75% of the total population are farmers and in 2011 our GDP about 30% are from agriculture. And last year we, there's a bad news concerning environmental problem. Cambodia has ranked the second world most effective country by climate change. You know why? 
because we tend to have the farmers tend to have the poor adaptation skill have, they don't have the technical skill so what I mean is that there's technical assistance are lacking for Cambodia in terms of agriculture and other sectors as well so that is why vocational education is important and my second argument why do we need why we also need academic education as you already know all over the news Cambodia now preparing for ASEAN economic community by 2015 there are the this integration will bring along opportunities and also threats the opportunities are we of course there be free flow of goods services trades investment and also the most important one is skilled labor so and out the challenges for Cambodia especially is that we'll be seeing a lot, a lot of foreigners occupy in our workplaces so basically Cambodia workers will be will be losing a lot of jobs by 2015 so basically for education is the main focal point here so why is academic education important the academic education are trained those people to become policy makers teachers they are the center people who play the driving seat, who are on the driving seat and play a huge role in improving human resource and education standard in our com in our country so in conclusion i think for for country development both vocational education and academic education uh, uh, do does uh, do matter for our country uh, development and also us uh, I want to quote one speech from uh, Mr. Renput Suvat, who is also ASEAN Secretary General. He said, uh, for Cambodia to prepare for ASEAN economic community, the teachers, students, those are those who, who will be playing the larger role. They are not policy maker. We are now, education is very lacking, and education plays a very central role here. Thank you. Thank you, Gacha, for your presentations. And now, again, it's the time for our judges to give you some questions. Yes, please. Um, thank you, Kesia, for your very interesting speech. And I happen to personally agree with you that both types of education are important for Cambodia. However, you seem to depict universities as being um, ivory towers concentrating only on theories. Isn't it possible for universities to also have a professional work-related orientation? Thank you for your question. Uh, yes, I do agree that uh, university studies provide both uh, theories and also practical uh, knowledge. But of course, um, in within a, a university years of studies, uh, we have four years of study in university, and basically we are studying about theories, concepts, and all of uh, those uh, conceptual knowledge. But we tend to, uh, for a Cambodian case, we tend to have a lack of uh, probably time in using those uh, four years of knowledge into practice. Uh, practical experience also acquired from university, uh, like we can say that it's an extra extra curriculum activities those are so also important uh, for uh, gaining uh, practical knowledge thank you thank you very much for your presentation um, okay. i'm curious how would you say you could um, encourage more people to go into academic education oh uh so you mean like right now, not many people, um, most of people are discouraged to go into academic education? Yes, you argue both of them are important, but many more people are in vocational education or in practical um, roles. So if you want more people into academic education, how can you encourage them? Mm, I see. Uh, it's pretty hard because um, practical education are really matters for their livelihood because what they practice they will be using for their during their work time, so they will earn money from it. But to to encourage them to involve in academic education is 
we talking about uh, a future or a sustainable development if we we bringing up uh, academic education. So, thank you, uh, Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> and after hearing the two contestants from the open category, we now hearing another man from uh, open category. It's Mr. Jia Sokong, and he's going to present on the topic: Is social networking damage our ability to communication face to face? So before that, we hopefully you enjoy his expression on the video clip. So please enjoy. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Chia Sokong, and I'm 23 years old. I'm from Institute of Foreign Languages, and today I'm very delighted to be able to participate in this event. Okay, everyone, let's take this journey with me, shall we? Good afternoon to distinguished guests, His Excellency, and my honorable judges and my beloved audience. Thank you for taking your time to be here. And today, I'm more than delighted and thrilled to be able to be standing here and presenting on a topic that I feel near and dear to my heart. It is about social networks. And I'm today asked to share an opinion whether social networking is damaging our ability to communicate face to face. And my answer to this question is a firm no. And there are two main reasons why I believe in contrary to the topic. First of all, I believe that social networking actually plays a role to accommodate the busy lifestyle that we are leading instead of ruining our friendship. Let's face it and admit it, that every day we have business, meeting, appointments, and jobs that we need to attend to. Some people even work on the weekends. They don't even have personal time for themselves. So how do you think that they can manage the time to actually sit and squeeze some time to meet up their friends. However, with social networks, you can just simply say hi with just one click away or getting updates of your friends by just sitting in front of a, by just sitting in front of a, of a computer. And if you have a Facebook account and if you use it very often, you would know that there's a function on Facebook that actually you can use to send out invitation to your friends by simply tagging a group of friends and asking them whether they want to join, whether they want to meet up and have a dinner with you to celebrate your victory at 7 o'clock this afternoon, or to actually ask them whether they want to join a jogging exercise on the morning of the weekends. So I, I don't see the harms there. And second of all, and second of all, who says that the distance will be the new will be the obstacle for making new friends? I have proved it wrong myself. Five years ago, back when Facebook was un unheard of and f and MySpace were popular, I got a message from a stranger, from a guy f from the United States of America. He was saying that he wanted to find a local friend because he was visiting Cambodia in the next few months and he was looking for a local friend to actually help him to guide around and to make and to let him to share some authentic experience. And eventually we got to meet and he has visited me several times ever since. So actually I don't see social networking is actually damaging our, com our ability to communicate face to face. Actually, it brings the world closer. Now, I do understand why some people are peer scornful of social network. Maybe because they are afraid of changes. And let's face it, humans are fearful of changes. And some people, just because they see people uh, in a table, even though they meet up, but they still busy with text messaging or with a social networking by logging on Facebook. And those people tend to exaggerate it. But what I wanted to say is that we have always understood that when the time has changed, so must we. We need to respond positively to this transition 
Because Facebook, just like I said, you can use it to send out your invitation. So it actually works as a tool that you can use to actually meet up your friends. And also, I be, uh, and if you share the same energy that I do, if you share the same passion that I do, if you share the same belief that I do, then lend me your hand, ladies and gentlemen. Dust off your pen and walk together with me to give the full support, full credits to social networks, the new tool in our new digital age. Thank you. Thank you, Sokong, for the presentations. And now, again, it's time for our judges to give some questions. Thank you. Please, uh, Thank you very much. You're talking about social network. And uh, to my knowledge, I understand that we have about 70,000 Cambodian users in social network, especially the Facebook. Uh, to your point of view, what do you think that this user can contribute to the development of uh, especially Cambodia? Um, um, I'm sorry, uh, uh, His Excellency, can you please repeat your question again? I say um, we have a uh, Facebook user or in social network. Okay. Do you think that these people, this user, can contribute to the development of Cambodia through the activities uh, on the network. Okay, Th uh, thank you, uh, His Excellency, for your meaningful questions. Uh, I believe that some of the users on, uh, some of the active users on Facebook are actually businessmen themselves, and they actually use the Facebook to advertise their campaign and their business on Facebook, and you can see that uh, their uh, different pages about business that actually asking uh, the, the user on Facebook to actually click like. So I think that this is one way of adver advertisement and this can also contribute to the new age of advertising in Cambodia. Yes, please, hey, Ambassador. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, the British Embassy has a very successful Facebook site called UK in Cambodia, and just today we got our 40,000th fan. Okay. My question for you, though, is um, can you use social networking too much? And if so, how much is too much? <laughs> um, that is a very challenging question, Ambassador, because uh, <laughs> the degree of, of of much is different from one person to another. Some people may spend eight hours on Facebook and they still think that they haven't spent enough time on Facebook. However, um, I believe that they need to be able to manage their time between their busy life, their busy schedule, and their uh, leisure time. For example, they, if they have to work eight hours a day, Maybe one hour of Facebooking is not too much, just to release the stress and getting updates with their friends. Thank you, Thank Sir you. Kong, for the presentation and answering questions from. Our